Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can join the YouTube channel directly at even $5 or $1 a month, or subscribe to oxum.substack.com or patreon.com slash oxum. Today's guest is Diakon Simon Mabatsion. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure, brother. My pleasure. Uh, we've recently made acquaintance through our mutual friend, Deacon Mehrat. And uh, I know you're a bright young man in the church who uh, is able to look at ideas and think critically, which is always you know, something that I have been for for over a decade. Um, you just can't have a church filled with NPCs. So that's true, that's I, true. <laughs> yeah. I would like to know um, the kind of, and, and this is a common theme that I that I ask people. For example, the Archdeacon Tesfa Mikhail, who's done a number of translations. So I'd like to ask you as well, because I think it's it's helpful for people to know how to raise their kids going forward, so that they could mm -hmm. be bright young men like you. How did your like? What type of faith did your parents have? And what contributions would you say they had to the faith that you have? Okay, thank you again for having me. But so for the question, it's actually like a really important question because like it ties into like, cause like you, like you hear what I'm about to say, but so in the beginning, in the beginning, so when I was like really, really young, starting from like, like five, six, especially my dad, some of you may or may not know, but my dad happens to be a kind. And so, you know, Every, every kind's dream, especially for their firstborn son, of course, is to follow their path and be, you know, be a deacon and like lead the church and like, you know, follow like his footsteps. And so when I was very young, um, like Bazuch Anayaragabina, he would like, he would very much like want me to like um, become a deacon. And so like, and it was like before I even started kindergarten or anything, you know. Like, I was, was going to say how young, like. <laughs> yeah, like he, he was, 13, he was, he was trying to get five. in early. He was trying to get it in early, and so like Zotir's Elotunamen, all of that, like Zotir's I I know I definitely finished before I even started like kindergarten, like I learned, and so you were learning the daily after, prayers and giz from him, and giz from from him, yeah, from him. Mm -hmm. So the daily prayers, sorry, the daily prayers, yeah, in um, what's it called? And giz I learned from him, and so after that, um, I had it like. And even me, myself, like, even from, like, being, like, a little kid, like, I always wanted to be a deacon. And so, like, like, seeing my dad, seeing everybody and, like, and obviously, like, all the Khanats, all the um, archdeacons and stuff, all the priests, everybody around him, they also wanted the same. And so every week um, in church, like, even, like, before I was a deacon, and I know uh, you have, like, a similar story to this, you're like, Deacon Simone, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, as, like, a little kid, and, you know, obviously me, like, I would eat that up. And I would eat it up, and I would be like, hey. Mine was more as a grown man, not as a kid, by the way. When I was a kid, <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was wild, wild west in L.A. Yeah, so for me, it was as a kid. And so, you know, I was like, oh, like, this is cool. Like, you know, like, maybe I do want to be a deacon. Mm -hmm. And then for my dad, like, the pressure and pressure got worse and worse, like, the older I got. And when I say older, like, I don't mean, like, me now, but, like, as a kid. So, like, mm -hmm. first, second, third grade, it was, like, that got it progressed more and more and more and so like at some point in my life like like around second third grade i remember i was like i wanted to be a deacon but i didn't want to do any of the learning i was like dude like like this learning stuff is hard like with mm -hmm. and like the prayer um i, forgot, I don't know what's called it the praise English. of mary yeah the mm -hmm. praise of mary so the praise of mary is like all seven days like for a second third grader like it's, it's pretty hard and so, and obviously as a kid, like you want to do other stuff too. You want to like, it's not like Ethiopia when like you go to Kolo Timur and like, that's all you do 24 seven. Like, dude, I, I want to play outside. I want to mm -hmm. like, like go to like the roller skating place. Like I, like, I just wanted to do what like a normal kid did. And so like, I started to like, not want to learn and like not want to like think. But then, um, so like there was that part of my life. And then like, my dad saw that and so he's like took the pedal off the gas and so he was like you know what like there's his own time for everything he just he left it 
still, of course, I would still have to go to church every week. But, yeah. you know, like, and that's where on time, I imagine. Hot, if, yeah, of course. Yeah. No, I don't know. Sometimes some families, if there's a married priest, maybe the, the mother might come later with the kids if the kids are particularly troublesome. Yeah, no, no, no. The, all, family all together. <laughs> um, when we were going together, so it was 3 a.m. every week we'd get up, over and everybody together and just go. And so um, especially so um, not to get into it, but um, I ended up switching churches due to as we all know like um the scene old splitting at one point in our life and so at this new church like it's three kanat and it's just them by themselves you know so now i'm like so now i'm really like you know like like this is like crunch time and so my uncle used to teach on phone calls kids and so they would teach um Kassid and Sata, some, some of the prayer of the hours and so you know I knew one, I knew one um, uh, Melk out of like the Melkasin. I knew one of them. And I'm at church one day. And so what we would do is we would go to church and then up until Kadasi, go to the back of the church, sleep with my mom. And mm-hmm. then once Kidan came up, you know, I would get a couple kicks and I would know it was time. So I would get up, <laughs> go to the front, go to the front, you know, set up the computer, you know, do, do whatever I had to do. And so this one time though, like I wasn't able to sleep and I heard this Malika Sid. Uh, um, and so I was like, wait, 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 I know this, I know this. So I get up and I go to the front and nobody says anything to me. Like it's, it was just one con at that time doing it by himself. And then I stand next to him and I say it and I start saying it. Yeah. I start saying it. And then he, wow. looks, he looks at me, he looks at me and he's like, oh, he's like, okay, let me just let him, you know, let me finish. And then I finish, right? I finished and he's like, good job, good job, good job. And then <laughs> he says one, and then it's back to my turn, right? So he's like, oh, this kid learned Melkasin finally. Little someone who I seen like grow up some, he knows Melkasin. This is nice. I'm still in like what, third, like fourth, fifth grade probably right now. Wow. I say the same one over again. <laughs> That's the only one I know. <laughs> so it comes back to my turn. <laughs> and I say, the, I say the same one over again. Because I still don't understand how it works, how everything yeah. works and stuff. And then so and then he's like, like a good job, good job. He's like, go back <laughs> to sleep with your mom. <laughs> but no, so then I go back and then I'm like, I, I feel so accomplished that day. I'm like, like, like it felt so good to say it. And so I was like, you know what? So then I started I started just standing with him after that. And then just by like hearing and stuff, I like I got the hang of it. And then after that, like, there was no going back. It was just one thing after another, one thing after another. And then it was even to a point where, you know, I was so invested in church that, um, like, and, and as a little kid, like, fifth, sixth grade, like, you don't, like, you don't need much to, like, get, get past, like, in school. But, like, I was, like, so invested in church that I started to, like, like, my dad was scared I was going to, like, neglect school. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, and that became a fear for him. And so it turned. So, like, which is why I, I thought it was, like, a very important, interesting question. Because at one point, it was gas all the way to the, like, to the metal and then let go. And then it was even a point where, like, he started to try to, like, press on the brakes. He was, like, you know, like, school and stuff, too. So then after that, uh, my mom saw, like, my interest, too, and stuff. And, um like she was like the green light he was waiting on to like let me become a deacon because uh what's it called she was very like um not against it but very much like gonna he still has a lot to like you know and being a deacon is a lifelong what's it called um commitment and so she was like she was very like much like she was always on the brakes she was always on the brakes like let him like you know grow slowly and stuff because it's a big responsibility but then finally she got the um she gave the go ahead and then summer of 2017 i became a deacon and then and how old yeah, were you by history. by that point 12 so i was 12 mm-hmm. um and then turning 13 in like three or four 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 months yeah yeah and did they um give you any expectations i i imagine and i want to come back to the um the professional academic pursuits versus the clerical pursuits but 
when they were finally ordaining you, were they putting any requirements for you? And this will get into our later conversation as well to have any sort of catechism or understanding of Christian doctrine? Or is it like, have you memorized these daily prayers and the singing of the liturgy? So very good question because um, I kind of take my, like the way I was ordained, like as the way I view deaconship as a whole. And it's funny, I wrote my college essay literally about my ordainment and how like, at the time, even though I wanted it so bad, I didn't know what I wanted. I, I didn't know what I truly wanted. The, all I thought there was to it was, you know, going to church, saying stuff, getting to go behind the magical curtains that I had no idea, you know, what happened behind, you know, just being part of like, you know, being part of the cool people of church. That's what the, like at, at age 12, that's all there was to it. And um so to your question though no i didn't like i knew up until wednesday of the praise of uh mary so the what mm -hmm. i knew up to wednesday and then as for the literary gene stuff um belim did just by like going to church every week like so much like i knew the liturgy i, I knew all of it and so and all and i knew um Zeltit Zeltit. but the requirements to be a deacon like truly is like even for us, like they tell us it's just with Dasi Madam Zotrits Adult and like Kandasi and stuff, but like in Ethiopia, like Ankat's Abrahana, there's you with Dushua, Melkamara, Melkai, so you have to know all this and be of age to even become a deacon. But that's not how it was for a lot of people. For a lot of people, especially in the uh, let alone the diaspora, even in Ethiopia, a lot of like places in Geth are where like their Apasat don't come, even though they may not serve. People just, you know, because in the old times at least, people would like, even my uncle that I knew, he didn't even know he was a deacon up until like 30, 40 years later when he found his deaconship card and in a Bible that his dad kept after his dad passed, he got some of the belongings and opened up one of like um, his dad's Bibles and saw his deaconship card. And he was like, I was a deacon. And so like, that's so crazy. Yeah, so he I forgot. <laughs> He, he, because he, it was when he was a very like it was um he was a, a little kid, Apapas had came to like their part of um the Geta and so like Apapas coming is like a once in a million so everyone would take their kids and just you know go towards Apapas and then like he kabalalu and then mini but his parents and his family never like pushed on it like hard like he never like pursued it after that he became a deacon and then just kept um uh living life and so even him himself he was like only like if I had known. And so, yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know any of that. And so like, and even in America, the requirements are a lot like, you know, lower in general, but even then I'd even meet those requirements. So. Yeah. And it's very interesting, whatever the requirements are, let's say they're the traditional ones and they're about memorizing certain prayers and singing the liturgy or chanting the liturgy. You brought up an interesting point when you were talking about how you got there and the kind of concerns of your parents. I have noticed a thing that is a rule, and there are exceptions to the rule, like our mutual friend, but it seems that the more time and energy you put into being like a super deacon who knows everything, the more the less time you're inherently going to be putting in other things. And if it was Ethiopia, there are kind of direct paths to the traditional school through which you can become like a salaried employee of the church. In America, it's mm -hmm. less clear how you become a salaried employee of the church. And it's really reserved for the priests, unless you're like a deacon who's also a full blown, you know, marigeta, like a lead cantor. Um, so mm -hmm. unless you've like really gone all the way or you're mm -hmm. some type mm -hmm. of, um, person who's put that work into sermons and then a particular church believes that sermons are so valuable that they hire you so un unless you're like at the top the creme de la creme of sermons or mm -hmm. of leading some type of liturgy uh, unless you're a married priest or a monk it's unlikely that you're going to get hired for it and so it means that usually your academics are going to be poor or if you have a job, your job is not going to be the most prestigious, high paying job because you have this thing that's like not just a hobby and a passion project, but it's like it's your vocation. It's your spiritual vocation that you've put your your whole life and soul into. 
So I'm wondering if you have a different experience, like from the people that you know, whether they're older than you or younger than you, like, is it true for you anecdotally, the higher the quality of the, the deacon in terms of all the things that he knows, does it mean that he kind of slacks off in academics or his work? No, so by by no means is, is that true. And even like, I don't, I mean, well, you've had him on the show, but so I'm I'm gonna name drop just one person just because like, um, thing. But Meret, I own Diago Meret, one of my close friends. We can see by him. We can see by so many others. That, I mean, to be honest, I don't know what the mystery is behind it. I don't know what the mystery is. This is God's work, and G, like. But that's what that's what I'm pushing me, you on and asking you yeah. is is Meret the rule or the exception? Is is he the most common thing that you're seeing with deacons that excel? I'm not asking if you mm -hmm. have exceptions. I'm saying like, what is the rule that you see? Because I'll say I know that I know a couple counter examples, like you mentioned, you know. But it's um, just I feel like I feel like it's just having like like a discipline. If you're disciplined, like, and what I mean like discipline is not like like genuinely like telling yourself like if you set a goal, like you will do it like you have to put your head to it i always and i i live by this if there's a will there's a way so if there's if there's a type of like willingness to be successful in both like a true willingness inside like there's nothing that can stop you except for yourself so i just think i think it's just it's just a matter of finding that and actually like putting it to like use that makes sense that that's good so since around the time of middle school almost on the transition to high school now you're in college you've you've been on this path senior, since 2017. Senior, senior. Se sen a senior yeah senior in high school high school in high school i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah. no, it's, okay. It's, okay. It's, it's okay i thought you were old <laughs> okay. so, uh, <laughs> um so since that kind of path that you've been on you have been kind of uh increasing in your knowledge of the church slowly and slowly how much of your interactions have been with the orthodox church like as it's expressed in ethiopia um, versus like all of our sister churches okay you might say the question one more time yeah so basically is everything you know about the church from the ethiopian parishes that you've been visiting or have you ever had any Coptic or Armenian or Syrian or Indian Orthodox yeah. friends? And have you ever visited their churches? Have you ever read about them? So, um, so yeah, so yes, I have to, to your question. So um, there was a point in my life. So just like I said, like even now we were talking about like my deaconship, like the things I thought about the church, I just thought, you know, church, you know, you come, you say things, you sing mezmud, play kavaro, you know, eat and then you go home. You know, that's all I thought there was to it. And then I became a deacon and I realized there's even more to it. And then I grew, I grew like in my um, deaconship and I learned and like, and I hear about, you know, sister churches and how we're in communion with such churches. Um, and so, and I also hear that there are other Orthodox churches that we're not in communion with, like the Greeks and stuff. And so um, recently, recently, and I mean, I feel like I have to give you a shout out, you and Meta, to your honorable shout outs for like this, not, I don't wanna see the spark, but like seeing like you guys and like the way um, you guys were so like well-versed in your theology, it pushed me to be like, you know, like they know the, like not only our faith, but like orthodoxy and all like the back of their hand. And so I was like, like, I, I, what am I doing? Like, like, and so it kind of pushes thing in me to like want to like understand you know what makes the ethiopian orthodox church the ethiopian orthodox church what makes what makes it different from the other orthodox churches you know what happened what like what about it is it i learned you know it, it, it was about terms when it came to christology okay what does that mean what does christology mean what do all these mariology what do all these things mean and, you know, what do they mean to how do we interpret them as Orthodox Christians? If someone were to ask me the ortho, the Ethiopian Orthodox stance on something, would I be able to truly like, like respond, you know? And so I was like, 
and like when it comes to a lot of like very 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 like important questions a lot of the times i find myself going to other people and we all know like our uh like and so i was like i want to be a part of this ukat and so i've i've recently been like you know backtracking into like the history of the church what the like when the church was here when the splits happened and so like i've i've come across some you know interesting things and so yeah so to your question yes yes i do so that's interesting um was there any sort of sunday school that ever taught you any of these things or did any of the clergy at your church after you had been ordained ever tell you about any of these things or this is all just on your own recently no this is all just on my own recently um i it's sad to say but um the Kanath, i can't speak for other places but the Kanath in general here um i feel like having done a the um a job to the best of their abilities to strengthen us and so a lot of and i can say this for the vast 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 majority of diaspora i feel like it's it's all from inside you know from ourselves that we've came to these and so yeah that yeah that that's fascinating yeah i when i was telling you la was the wild wild west when i was growing up it really wasn't any different except you know you could imagine in la we didn't even have natalas you know when we were kids i my parents never brought me to church my aunties would bring me to church and they would bring me not at three in the morning like you but they would bring me around 9 a.m they would bring me right on time to line up to receive kurban so pretty much the end of the liturgy and i would receive communion then i would eat some donuts and then i would listen to um spiritual singing and you know kettle drum hitting for a little bit and then we'd go into some room where they try to teach us the Giz alphabet except it'd be the same first row every time and they try to teach you basic <laughs> phrases in amharic which i found insulting because I, I was fluent in amharic ever since i was a kid and so what we would do is we'd go outside and we'd wrestle and we'd race and we'd pick up uh, water balloons from the 98 cent store throw them at each other and uh play uh pokemon cards and other things like that like it, it was more yeah, almost like a community center than yeah. a teaching but ever since i'd say a minimum of 2012 maybe 2010 push it 2008 2009 which is way after i grew up uh in la we've had very expansive sunday schools at at least two of the major churches i can give witness to and, and a couple of the others do their their effort as well i know you recently came across some interviews that i did one with a kind of byzantine catholic uh podcast and another uh, with a convert to eastern orthodoxy i'm i'm wondering what you thought of those and how you even encountered them in the first place and if you had done any sort of other online research that you could plug for other people who are young curious minds like you that like if 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 you met someone like you where would you send them to start off okay so before i before i answer your question um i just want to add on for like a good amount of like my lifetime up until like that day where i sang the um malkasil with kasis just as like we would go to the basement after Wengate, so we would stay till Wengate after Wengate, um, because that would they would tell us our duties are up, and then we would have to go downstairs and like you know like learn the mezbu for the day or something. But you know even though like it was so yeah so um and it got to the point where the mezbu like, of Saint Yadid or some of the modern ones, no the modern ones <laughs> like oh, Mariam okay. Fidel, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so um so yeah so then it got to the point where now like we uh we laugh about it and so like we say like you know like we were the basement boys because <laughs> we would go to the basement that's just we call ourselves the basement boys who slow stairs and so it's, it's kind of a funny joke that we talk about but um can you hear me yeah i can hear you can you hear me? okay okay so to yeah, to your yeah, question go ahead um so to your question um who would I like? Where would I have them start? A place for me. Knowledgeable in theology, I would say go to them and ask a 
like ask questions, ask them for resources. It's it's what I did. Say that so again. It, it, I, it cut out a little bit. It cut out a little bit, uh, Simone. So say that again. You're you're there now though. Say it again. Okay. So can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So um. Okay, it's telling me I can't see you, but okay. So for me, what I did was I went to a priest who I felt like was very well versed in theology, and I asked him. I said, "Where do I start?" And so he gave me a book, and I'm they uh, I'm still reading the book, and so that's where I'm starting. And then the rest from your page, from the interviews you were talking about. So, um, hello, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So um, when it came to to um, your interviews and some things I picked up like from your interviews is that, especially in the Ethiopian Orthodox Toronto Church, we have a lot of gray areas with some topics that um, you know to some might you know sound or seem like off, but is the true like stance of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and so like coming uh, coming across these were like probably like one of the main things that also like told me you know like i need to keep at this theology because um i like and i'm not one to say you know i'm like above the synod or above you know the religion but if the fathers um and the theologians the saints um you know are they right All right, and we're back. So you were explaining to us after having watched certain online videos about the Orthodox Church that and, and not really receiving any education out of being a member of the Basement Boys in terms of uh, catechesis or any formal uh, church teaching that you began to start reading things on your own about the church and starting to reflect critically about some of the teachings of the church yeah that's exactly what happened so yeah so um i just started asking myself questions i was like you know i always thought this was one thing but this is more a cultural thing you know but my whole life i thought it was against our religion you know, no need to go into specifics, but, you know, like the eating of certain foods that I thought, you know, was like, oh, wow, this is, you know, interesting to know that, you know, like this is more just a cultural thing that just came from us because Ethiopians were naturally Semitic. Well, oh, okay. And it led me on to like another question, another question and another question. And so like I say I'm a part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but, you know, like Am I, I ask myself like, and and I, I serve her and I serve her like with everything I have, but like, do I like, I ask myself like, do I really know everything I need to know? And so it pushed me to like, learn more. Yeah, and um, when you're going through this evolution, what what were some of the, easier things and what were some of the harder things to kind of let go of but also see the bigger picture of you want to see the uh, you want to see the question one more time sorry yeah so what were the particular church teachings that you thought that you were evolving on so um the main thing the main thing that like the main question that really struck my like wanting to know for more was I read a book about Bitsu Abuena Gorgorios, Berkata Choidresan. Um they were actually the father that yeah the they're actually the father that founded Mabarak Dusan, who I know to be, you know, one of the most, you know, vigilant and strong like Mahabars known to like our religion. And so reading his book, you know, uh he wrote in his book about how um, eating pork and things like that were, you know, not against their religion and explained how it came more of, from, you know, the Semitic type of line. And then I also heard another father speak about this. Um, 
Butso Abu Navas, I heard him talk about it on an interview. He said the same mm-hmm. thing. And so I was like, hold up. So now he I was a student, by the way. It. He was a student at Zawai Monastery. Abu Navas was Abu Nagorgorio's student? That's right. That's so interesting. See? And so, yeah. And so I heard both these Butso and about to say this. And so I was like, hold up. You know, my whole life, you know, I was like, you know, this is against your religion. Da, 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 da. And it's not even, and it, this isn't like, it's not that I would eat it. Like, I wouldn't, it's not because. So you didn't you grow know, up on I was uh, grown up, bacon and pepper. I, I, I didn't grow up on it, so I, <laughs> I, I still wouldn't eat it. But, you know, my whole life, people were saying, you know, like, this is against the, the religion. And so if an Abbat, especially as big as the one that, you know, founded Mahabharata Qudusan, and if they didn't have a mess for this, and you know, if this was, you know, thing. So I was like, what's really the truth? So then it led me to like more and more. This is just, this is just like one small one that like, you know, um, led me to like want to learn more. And then that's when I learned how like, you know, Ethiopians are Jewish. Like we were Jewish before, you know. And so I learned how like that's where that came from. And then, you know, it's, that's how it went. That's good. Um, yeah, the kind of the mixing and matching the way Abu Nabarnabas always used to say it. He said it in his book, Samata Wahado, and the teachings, Wangilbo Orit and Dogma and Kanona, a long time ago, I think even in the 90s and certainly in the early 2000s, which is why he got both famous and infamous depending on who you'd ask. But he would always say, that it's good to know the differences between dogma of the church, canon laws of the church, and if you're impolite, what you'd call old wives' tales, or if you're being polite, what you'd call the kind of lowercase t traditions of the church. I, I know you also have begun to kind of involve yourself in meeting other orthodox minds in, in person. Could you mm-hmm. give a review of the kind of uh, group of orthodox and the panel that you saw earlier today? Yeah, so it's funny. Earlier today, it also I was at a panel. Um, there was people from the Greek Orthodox, um, Russian. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, people from the Russian, Greek Orthodox, Coptics, and so um, I raised some of these questions, and so um, I got unanimous answers from everybody. And so, like, I I told myself, I was like, if this is the case, and if these are the churches that we are in communion with, you know, what's going on? Why is it so hard to, for um, Ethiopians, just Ethiopians, us, to, like, be, like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's scared or, like, just not, like, like, knowing what the Orthodox churches, like, the stance is. And I feel like I don't blame the people as much as I blame, you know, some of like the fathers because they haven't spoke about spoken out about these things. And, you know, I know we all like the church has a lot more pressing issues, which is very true. Um, but, you know, some of these things are, you know, like what make the church one adds two, two adds makes three and three makes four. And so I was thinking, you know, how many of these am I going to find before, you know, I go crazy? Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting game that we play as Orthodox because there's a beauty in how we don't change things often because that's how we've maintained the teaching of Christ so well. But at the same time, so if anyone's coming up, it's chopped up. I'm not the best editor, but we're making it work. Technical difficulties. Sorry. The enemy is against us, but we deny him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we were talking about how the Orthodox Church is beautiful in the vastness of her wisdom because she doesn't move so quickly. And that means that sometimes you want her to move quicker on certain things, but she takes her time and really meticulously analyzes anything before she makes any change it's a fundamentally kind of conservative mindset than a liberal one putting the kind of politics of those terms aside and just seeing its relationship between the rate of change and the rate of order and stability you can't 
be not changing at all. That stereotype people have of the church is not true to history, and it's it's frankly impossible. It means you're dead if you're not changing at all. But you can control the speed that you change things and what you change versus what you don't and the different categories we mentioned earlier of dogma canon and lowercase t tradition. So, yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating that we submit certain things to the Holy Synod and sometimes certain events prompt the Synod to act more. Historically, I always argue that we had, at least since the 1270s, I think the Aksumite period is a lot mistier and grayer and more opaque, but since the 1270s AD, we've had a lot of Egyptian bishops and we don't know how much good as they knew, if any at all, and how much micromanaging versus just sort of general ordination that they're doing all throughout the country. And so a, a lot of the excuses we hear is that the Holy Synod in Ethiopia is very young. And so maybe in, yeah, the, future, yeah. maybe in the future, they'll be addressing um, more things like that. But yeah, did you, did you have any other insights as to what you learned from hearing from all the various different Orthodox in person at this panel that you attended and or any other things that you've been reading or, or uh, listening to online? Yeah, so there was one really other main one that kind of, you know, um, grabbed my eye and it was um, on the topic of Christ and, you know, um, on his final like moments on the cross, um the prayer that he gave to the father saying uh, saying oh lord for they do not know what they are doing forgive them so um which took me back to you know orthodoxy you know what like what it means and so i learned about how um the different schisms happened and like you know the main schisms you know that put, make us different from everybody is our belief that Christ is full man and full God, you know, for somebody, for some so now. So we were like, and so I was like, you know, um, if if that's the case, and sometimes it's just you know wording problems in the way some things are like worded. And so you know, I was like, so what does that mean for us? Some people worded it in a way where it came off as blasphemous, but if you know one of the main things that makes us different from everybody is the way that we believe that god was also fully man you know why has this become a problem and so i don't want to go too much into in, into the in detail into the topic but you know it was just about you know um because for me it's very black and white either it is or it isn't and so it might not be the best answer but you know that was kind of the the main the, uh, another one of the main ones that uh, took that's, me back to the theology. That's yeah, that's good, and it, I don't know why, but it it actually reminds me that some of these topics people have different opinions on how to address them, right? Like mm -hmm. one venue is behind closed doors in the Holy Synod with mainly just the bishops making decisions, but you could say monks, married priests, and deacons show up and may be able to contribute a question or a thought that kind of prompts the bishops to do that. There's always this thing, also this thing called the Likawand Gubai, or the kind of elders that are associated with the school of scriptures and patristics who are supposed to be the defenders of the faith. And sometimes they're more specialized in these subjects than even the bishops. And so communication between that conference of scriptural and patristic experts of the church with the council of bishops or assembly of bishops known as the holy synod makes these decisions behind closed doors whenever they want to at their own pace mm -hmm. a newer phenomenon that we'd see is people for example on instagram live which is very much uh, a sign of the times having these debates and mm -hmm. i wonder what your take is as a young man in the church serving as an ordained minister a deacon although it's used differently in different churches definitely in the ethiopian church what do you think is the role of being serious versus trolling on matters of faith in in the public eye very good question i think I think um, 
you know, there's always fun in times, uh, what's it called? There's always a time for fun and jokes. Um, but you know, um, I feel like, and to, I feel like too, like trolling, like there's always like, you know, a certain extent where like you can go to, you know, with being like good. But when it comes to like a matter like a faith like this, um, I feel like like we can all like joke around and have fun, you know, after it gets resolved. And so I feel like, um, you know, at like staying true to your um, belief while, you know, having a little like fun and jokes with it, I, I think there's no harm in it. But um, yeah, I feel like like always like staying true to your stance that was always 100%. Yeah, like how 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 do you kind of define trolling and joking online and you know how familiar with someone do you have to be? Do you only like joke and troll with your closest homies or would you joke and troll random people if they hopped in an Instagram live or if you met them in real life somewhere else? I feel like I feel like it depends. It's like a case to case type of thing where so um like with my closest friends and stuff you know like you know we're always trolling you know that's all we do um when it comes to like things on like instagram live and stuff you know like i tr i try and be like more conservative but you know with instagram live now it's up to four people and so if i'm on live with with trolls and you know it's time for trolling you know um i can't i can't be the odd one out but also though like um like i know like some people like to troll they'll like bring up these topics and then purposely like argue the opposite of what's true and like the op and argue what everybody wants to hear like as a troll and like you know like try and like challenge you on live like that i feel like i feel like it's too much you know because it's like you know knowing like knowing what you know knowing like that it's supposed to be one way like, why are you trying to argue me on live about something that you know, like, that we both know is one way? Yeah, I think it's just differences of opinions, like, of uh, how to address topics, whether they're spicy or bland, and the yeah, time exactly. and place and, and context in which it's appropriate. As we're winding down, could you bless my audience with any web or spiritual song that is either seasonal or on your mind or that you've been practicing of late? um okay so yeah so um kirana Bretz, yeah you can't see kirana Bretz, um is about like, just the feast of the virgin mary um or the covenant of mercy we should call her um has just passed um i can say what up from that if that's please yeah na good is what bad as I'm a yena guswan yena this one bad I mean, Zimara Malaik, the Asamalan, may God you, have you hear the melodies of the angels. Is there any sort of parting wisdom that you'd have for deacons that are up and coming or even? non-deacons who are parishioners who want to learn more about the theology and about the the liturgies and the scriptures according to the ethiopian church so yeah so um i feel like to start off um for me what took me like what took me to get started 
was realizing that without theology, there is no church, you know, with, without the study of all these things, you know, like we might as well just be, you know, talking to walls. And so um, like, I feel like all of us need to, what's it called? Um, understand like, you know, the importance of theology and then have that hunger to want to like learn more. And so I feel like for deacons, especially in the diaspora, like our age, like as cliche, like as it sounds like, you know, it's, there's only going to be so many more, you know, kanat and diakonat, like of like from the elders, there's only going to be so much of them, you know, that come in part before, you know, we're literally stuck with the church. And so um, I just advise everybody to, I, cause once we're in it, you know, you, there's no going out. It's like, it's like the one job, you know, like you can't really retire from, this is a lifelong commitment once you're in. And so, um, and it's always good to know more. It's always good to know more. And so I feel like you know, just learning more here and there, you know, it, it never hurts. And so that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your words of encouragement and for coming on the program. I appreciate you for having me.